On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Hawkeye Nation, to another episode of the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast, your daily podcast covering your Iowa Hawkeyes on the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, I am your host, Andrew Wade. And as always, after every single game, we are joined by former Iowa running back LaShawn Daniels. This is not exactly the game we wanted to cover uh, after after yesterday's game, right? We, we've covered six wins at this point. We did not want to come in here talking about a loss, but here we are. Before we get into that, though, I want to thank you all for making the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast your first listen every single day. You can find the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast wherever you get podcasts at and also on YouTube for free Monday through Friday to search Lockdown Hawkeyes. And LaShawn, this was uh, – we knew we knew this had to be coming at some point, right? When I when we started this season, no one was predicting Iowa to go twelve and zero. I personally had Iowa ten and two. I even predicted Iowa to lose to Purdue. However, I did not. When you win six games like that, I just thought this team might be different, man. I just thought Kirk and Phil might have figured some things out playing Jeff Brom. I thought this was not going to be the year where they lost to Purdue, and I did not think this was going to be the worst loss to Purdue they've ever had since Jeff Brom took over. Um, What a frustrating day. Before we get into all that, though, how are you personally doing today, man? (laughs) Personally, I'm good. Personally, I'm good. Um, You know, not too much to complain about. Um, Obviously, the loss yesterday was uh, tough. But, you know, other than that, we're good. Yeah, man. You would have thought that someone burned down everyone's house in Iowa Hawkeye Nation the way people were reacting, including myself. Uh, I probably yelled at the TV a little too much. I uh, was a little angry for a couple hours. My wife's like, what is your deal? I'm like, it's an Iowa football game. I don't know what to tell you. I just, they, they lost. They got their butt kicked. I mean, it was just, oh man, it was just such a beat down. We're going to cover all that on the show today. But first, I want to get into some of the positives. We'll get to the positives. We'll get to everything else that happened. And then I want to kind of wrap it up with how do you handle this? How do the players handle this? Um, how do we move forward from here? So first off, good. Uh, I want to touch on Tyler Goodson. I thought he ran harder than I've seen him run all season. I mean, it looked like there were points in the game where he was he was looking for contact. He's like, you know what? I am a running back, and I am one of the best running backs in the nation, and I'm going to run you over, or we're going to fall down together, but I'm going to hit you as hard as I can. However, that didn't happen until after that second possession where it looked like Ivory Kelly Martin was getting literally every snap. Um, so I want to touch on that with you. Do you think that was – intentional that Tyler was not in at all on that series because it looked like he was dancing a little bit maybe that first series wanted to get your thoughts from your uh, running back perspective there um yeah they because <laughs> I know the staff because I know because I know the staff and they've done it before <laughs> um and there were some plays um early on where again Tyler was probably dancing a little bit too much there's lots of times where he's getting tackled and like his feet aren't even moving, like they're basically just standing right next to each other, you know, no, no base. And you no, know, cause he's just looking for, you know, the next cut, he's looking for the home run. Right. And, um, you know, obviously like how the game was going, uh, taking those tackles for losses was not going to help us at all. So putting Ivory in there and, you know, Ivory's a good running back, right? He does good things. Yeah. Um, and I love the way how he hits the hole and I know the coaching staff does as well. So um, I think getting him in there and having Tyler see that for a little bit, like, hey, like, this is how we need you to play at, play right now. Um, definitely probably lit a fire under him for sure. Um, and obviously, you know, they probably felt like, you know, Ivory was going to help us give a, get, a, get a little spark. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it does happen. And that's probably exactly what did happen. And, you know, then he did come back in um, and change it up a little bit. There was one on the outside zone where he was looking for a cutback, which is 99% of the time never there on outside zone play. But then like a few (laughs) plays later, they did on the inside zone and the cutback was there because inside zone plays um, are essentially designed to cut back. So, uh, yeah, it definitely does happen. But I did love the way uh, that Tyler responded and, you know, was running the football, you know, in that second quarter. Um, you know, after, you know, essentially being pulled in a sense. Um, so. 
Yeah, I mean that was a that was a pretty. I mean, it's a little bit obvious. The, the announcers were like, "Is Tyler hurt? Is Tyler hurt?" And I was like, "I feel like they were a little bit pissed off." About, I mean, he, I think with Tyler, you get boomer bust, right? I mean, he's the guy who's going to get you those big plays. He's the guy who can do those home run type plays. Look at what he did against Maryland. I mean, without <laughs> Tyler's dancing, we don't get some of those first downs against Maryland. Granted, we didn't really need them against Maryland nearly as much, but you have to right. People forget that Ivory Kelly Martin was the starting running back three years ago. Ivory Kelly Martin is a very talented back. He maybe doesn't have as big of a boom potential as Tyler, not for lack of gifts, but because he is just going to hit that hole and he's going to get that four or five or six yards, kind of like a Makai Sargent almost with a bit more mm-hmm. speed um, mm-hmm. and maybe not as not as great of ball protection as Makai Sargent had, but still, still solid. So definitely yeah. interesting all around. I thought Tyler ran really well after that happened. I mean, uh, lowering his shoulder into people. There was one play. I can't remember what, what the play exactly was, but – the, there was just no hole there, and he just turned to the side and just did a battering ram right into the guys. Like, you know, I'm gonna get three yards. Like, mm-hmm. this is gonna mm-hmm. happen. So, mm-hmm. love to see that. Um, love to see Tyler play at that kind of authority. Uh, I hope he can kind of find the right balance there, right? Because yep. some of the good things he can do is not, it, it does come from dancing or it does come from taking, you know, an extra couple steps. But sometimes in that game, you just need to get, you need to get the hole. We can't have yep. that many negative plays. Exactly. Um, Speaking of Ivory Kelly Martin, I thought he did a really good job, obviously, on that kick return. Um, I thought Charlie Jones did a really good job in returning as well. Uh, mm-hmm. The two biggest spark plays we really had all game. Uh, so special teams I thought was pretty solid all around outside of, uh, you know, the str- Caleb Shudok missing that that short field goal, which is kind of weird. Anything you want to add to the special teams aspect of things? No, not really. I mean, the special teams, again, you know, they do a great job. Uh you know, they've been doing a great job all year, and obviously they continued yesterday. Um, obviously, Kale missed that um, kick, unfortunately. But, I mean, that happens, right? I mean, yeah. fine shanks happen, right? It's just unfortunate that that's when it happened, right? With, um, what was it, like a 25-yard field? It was like such that. a chip shot. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't that just happen against yeah. Purdue? Like, yeah. Anything that should happen does happen against Purdue. <laughs> like yep. Caleb misses his first real kick because last time he missed a kick was a bad snap. He misses yep. his first actual kick of the. I mean, what the heck? Purdue Purdue muffs two punts essentially and <laughs> gathers them quickly. I'm like, oh my yes. gosh, these are like momentum changing things that could have happened that just doesn't happen against Purdue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I mean, I love that. Uh, you know, special teams were still doing their thing and that Charlie and Ivory, you know, were trying to provide some spark plays, right? Getting us, you know, inside the 20 yard line, um, for, you know, at the end of the football game, even when, you know, it was basically out of reach at that point. But I still love that. Love to see that effort and, um, you know, try to put us in a position where, you know, where crazier things have happened. So, Absolutely. I also thought, I mean, the grades aren't going to say this, but I thought Terry Roberts did a solid job, all things mm-hmm. considered, in his mm-hmm. first start. Um, not an easy position to be in. Um, you know that Purdue is going to attack you. You know that Purdue is going to come at you pretty darn hard. And they did. I mean, that first series, they attacked him, I think, three times. Um, he did end up allowing four receptions for 59 yards. Uh, three of those were to Milton Wright. Um, again, I thought overall Terry Roberts, though, you could have you could have played you could have played worse, right? And Terry Roberts yeah. played pretty good in his first start. Um, of his career. So anything you want yeah. to add on that side? Yeah, no, I mean, he's a young guy getting out there for the first time. I mean, as a, as a starter in Big Ten play, you know, against a team that's clearly obviously given us fits for the past five years. Um, and, you know, I thought he did a good job out there, you know, all things considered. Um, he was definitely like really like the least of my worry yeah. <laughs> yesterday on the defensive side of the football so um yeah i mean I thought terry terry did a great job filling in um and obviously he still has a bright future um and a bright career ahead of him um so so yeah thought he did well yeah um anything else you want to call out from the the good angle uh that's that basically wraps <laughs> it up from what i had so anything you want to call out from the good before we uh go into the ugly uh <laughs> no, <laughs> no, one of those not days. Much. Um, yeah, no, there's not, 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 not too much else. Sounds Maybe good. I'll think of something later, but no. Nah. Yeah, if we if we do, we I definitely want to make sure we cover as much good as possible. <laughs> but there, I tried writing down stuff, but I just 
I really couldn't think of a whole lot. Uh, it was just one of those games. I think almost a throwaway. Let's move on. Let's try to play Wisconsin. We'll talk about all that, though, because there was a lot to talk about in terms of the bad and the ugly. But I do want to tell you about Price Picks. Price Picks is daily fantasy made easy. It is made for all of you college football fanatics out there. I personally love this, and I know that you will too. Price Picks is a leader in college sports daily fantasy. They offer more college football props than anyone in the world. And they offer all the star players of the Power Five, as well as mid-major players you might not have even heard of. They offer literally any prop you can think of, from yardage to touchdowns, even interceptions thrown. For example, if you picked literally the under on anything Iowa offensively yesterday, you probably hit it. And right now, our users can get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 when you use the promo code Locked On. All you have to do, go to Price Picks. Pick two to five players and over under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry. It's just you versus the projected number. They also allow mid, mid mixed sports entries. Wow, that was a tough word to say here. <laughs> and prize picks is safe and offers fast withdrawals. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com and use the promo code locked on or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. I want to thank you all again for making the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast your first listen every single day. You can find the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast wherever you get podcasts at and also on YouTube for free at Locked On Hawkeyes. As always, LaShawn Daniels is joining us after every single game. LaShawn, always appreciate you coming on. Uh, you have such an amazing perspective on the game, especially when it comes to running backs. Uh, literally, the, my first thought when I saw that was like, I have to talk to LaShawn about this because he's going to give it a real that what happened with Tyler and Ivory. Um, so that was good, though. Tyler did come back, played well. A lot of bad, though, we have talked about in this game. Um, just all around. I think let's just get the, the big one out of the way. Can David Bell just go to the NFL? I just want him to leave. I want him to just declare early, for the love of God, stop playing college football. I'm sick of it. How does David Bell go for 240 yards receiving against an Iowa Hawkeye defense that shuts down literally everyone else? Um I just don't get it. Uh, they mentioned that they had some interesting game plans coming into this game. I, I can't remember who said it yesterday, but it might have been Kirk saying we did not want to get in one-on-one -on -one situations against David Bell. Well, if that was your game plan, you failed because David Bell had a one-on-one -on -one situation that felt like every freaking time he touched the ball. Uh, there's no reason why we should have to be playing scared on him doing a, a double move there should be someone behind him. There should be someone to bracketing him over top. I mean, our cornerbacks at a certain point, there was a it was a third down. We were blitzing as third and eight or third and nine. And our cornerbacks are playing eight, nine yards off because they're scared of the deep ball, it seemed like. Uh, especially against a David. I mean, I I don't know, man. I'm clearly not a defensive coordinator. I know I'm not as smart as Phil Parker. I still love Phil Parker, but the fact that this happens every single year is so incredibly frustrating. Anything you notice about that that just you know made you mad? Yeah. Well, <laughs> first things first, you obviously got to give David Bell a whole so bunch of good. credit. Obviously, yeah, he's a fantastic player who more than likely is going to go in the top, you know, 60 picks in this uh upcoming NFL draft because he's that good, right? I mean, he Got great speed. He catches the ball, makes contested catches. Everything you want to see from an NFL receiver. Good yak ability. I mean, he knocked down <laughs> Matt Hankins with a stiff arm and ran for another 40 yards. I'm like, gosh darn it, man. Come on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fantastic player. And But that being said, you know, the most frustrating thing is that he did go off like that. I mean, you look at his stats. He had 11 receptions, 240 yards, um, and one touchdown. I mean... I mean, like, that's just it. Uh, at some point, I mean, after two prior years, um, you know, of him going off, right, you would think that at this point, right, we would just, just try to completely eliminate him from the game, right? Whether you try to press the corner on over top of him and then you have, you know, the safety just, um, you know, bracket him over top, right? Um, and then force everybody else to beat you. I mean, for a fact, they didn't have a run game. They only had one a scholarship running back that was able to uh, run the football. Um, and, you know, obviously they have other receivers that are other good players, but they're not David Bell. Right. So, um, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, it's frustrating to go back and look at the stats and see how, you know, he was able to basically do whatever he wanted. Um, basically when he wanted, and it was even more frustrating, I think, you know, in the second half, 
um, you know, after, you know, going in the locker room at halftime, making the adjustments. I mean, um, you knew Purdue's situation going into the football game and uh, you knew that they were going to do whatever it took basically to get him the ball because uh, David Bell is their best player. Um, By far. Without a doubt. Like it's not yeah. even not even close. Um, the <laughs> best player on the entire team, and you know the fact that we couldn't contain him whatsoever, and that he was in so many one on ones was really really frustrating. I mean, the amount of times like you're looking on the film and you're looking at the replays, and you know you see uh, one corner over him, you see Matt over him, and you know he's kind of just doing doing whatever he wants without any help is just extremely frustrating because, um, you know, we knew that, that that's what they were going to do. So, yeah, it's tough. I mean, like you said, we knew the running game wasn't going to be that good and it wasn't, I mean, a lot of the yards they got were in garbage time, yeah. uh, from a running perspective, 33 yep. carries, 86 yards, a 2.6 yard per carry average. We did not need to bring a lot of guys in the box. Now, granted, we didn't have a pass rush, so we did need to bring some guys blitzing, but you're absolutely right. It's frustrating to watch, the one guy, the best guy on that team by far. There's, I should say, George Karlaftis, also a stud player as well. But on the offense side yeah. of the ball, David Bell, there is David Bell up here, and there's like 10 levels until the next best Purdue player. And that's not a knock on the next best Purdue player. That's just how good David Bell is. Mm -hmm. I understand initially putting Matt Hankins on him and saying, you know what, let's man up our best corner our guy who could have maybe went to the NFL last year, who's going to go to the NFL this year more than likely, mm -hmm. let's man him up and see what happens. And when he didn't succeed, then you have to make some changes. And like that crossing route where David Bell, Matt Hankins was a step behind him already. Matt Hankins missed the tackle. Dave Bell stiffs armed him down. We got, if someone's over top of him, maybe that's not a 60-yard gain. Maybe that's a, an eight-yard gain. You can live with that with David Bell. I'm okay with that, but man, you cannot let him just go off like that. Yeah. It's just, it's unacceptable. I, I <laughs> it's yeah. just so frustrating. I mean, sure. Milton Wright, TJ Sheffield, I don't care. Someone else catch the freaking ball. And I'm, I'm, I'm better off losing in that way to say we at least shut down David Bell, but I, yeah, um, man, that was frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's frustrating. It's frustrating. And I know it's not, like that type of defense isn't something we do, right? I mean, it's it's something it's we've never done. Yeah, right, right. I mean, like we've never um like I'm thinking, you know, at my time there and um from practicing to getting you know, any games, like that was just something that we never did. It was basically just uh stick to our stuff, stick to what we do, and like, you know, that was really basically it. So I don't know what their game plan was going into the week. I don't know how they practiced against it. Maybe they did, maybe they did you know, have some thoughts on bracketing him or, or whatnot. But, you know, as you mentioned, they probably just figured, let's just Matt, let Matt go at it, let him, you know, uh, see if he can contain him and, you know, go from there. And then especially after Matt went down, I don't know what he ended up coming down with, like where he hopped. His shoulder field. looked like it was like, not in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think like, like, and then after, well, after that happened, um, he just obviously Matt just wasn't himself after that point. Yep. And um that's when, you know, I think as a staff and um that's when you gotta make the adjustment, like, hey, um Kayvon or uh Jack, you guys gotta go over the top of David every single time he's out there, wherever he's lined up at, um, and give give Matt some help or Terry yep. some help, right? Because that's like that just can't happen. It can't happen, um, you know, at any point in time, you know, during the season, because we've seen the type of offense that we produced in the season this point. And when you have a guy that's going for 240 yards receiving and they're controlling the ball for literally eight minutes of drive, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's basically going to take you guys out the game because you're not going to be able to score enough points because you're not going to be able to have the football enough. And when you lose that explosive play back, play battle it's going to be very difficult to win a football game so it's tough and I, I would I, I would actually like to add too I mean on the two big plays I'm thinking of from Matt Hank and Dave Bell in the first half uh Matt was was mostly there I mean he gets that tackle David Bell's down that's 50 yards he doesn't get on his receiving total um yeah. that weird route what was that uh he almost like he ran an in 
and then he circled back. I mean, the, the route he ran was a little bit bizarre where Matt mm-hmm. Hankins kind of fell to the ground because he was covering it pretty well. Yeah. Uh, that, that was just a really – I mean, I thought that was a beautiful route by David Bell. I don't know mm-hmm. many corners who could cover that. But it, regardless, like you said, it, you got to make an adjustment at some point. Iowa predominantly plays zone. They're not a man team. Uh, but looking at this game, looking at how ineffective our pass rush is, something's got to give at some point because we are going to need to get pressure on the quarterback, and we're going to be facing some solid offensive lines coming up. Now, granted, thank thank God they don't have a David Bell on that side, so we might be able to do a little bit more man. We're going to get Riley Moss back as well, so things are going to hopefully improve, but definitely a concern uh, going forward. Before we get into more of that, though, I want to tell you all about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar on the market today. Maybe Iowa just needed some more Built Bars yesterday. Could have had a better performance against Purdue. One can only hope. I'll send them some as well. Built Bar has nine delicious flavors plus the occasional limited time flavor like like white chocolate birthday cake with sprinkles. They also have a pumpkin chocolate chip, I'm pretty sure, coming out soon. And that one is phenomenal. If you can get your hands on it, you absolutely have to. Obviously, I love the flavor. But my favorite part about these Built Bars is the health benefits as well. Between 17 and 18 grams of protein, 130 to 180 calories, only four to five grams of net sugar, or net carbs, excuse me. Nine amazing flavors, all tasty, all healthy. And LaShawn, you actually had your first Built Bar. You said it wasn't too bad, right? Pretty darn yeah. good? No, it's good. It's definitely one of the better protein bars I've ever had, for sure. I love it, man. So if it's good enough for me and LaShawn, probably good enough for you, or at least if it's good enough for LaShawn, probably good enough for you. I don't want to put myself in that category. <laughs> I'm not exactly the a big avid weightlifter, but go to BuiltBar.com and use the promo code LOCKED15. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, and you'll get 15% off your first order. Use the promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. All right, man. So we talked a lot about David Bell. I think we actually just spent the last 10 minutes talking about David Bell. Let's talk about some other bad things that happened in this game. Uh, George Karlaftis made our offensive line look like they were a JV squad. Uh, our offensive line is bad. Let's just let's just call it is what it is. Uh, we've been hiding some of these issues for a little bit this year. Tyler Linderbaum obviously has been very consistent. The offensive line has been, for the most part, up and down throughout the year. But George Karlaftis, man, he, I mean, it didn't matter who was the tackle. Mason Richmond, Nick DeYoung, Jack Plum. I mean, first off, these guys don't have a ton of experience. Nick DeYoung was a walk-on. Not saying that that's bad. I'm just trying to give some context to the situation. A walk-on. So more than likely not as developed coming into the Iowa football program or needed some you know skill development, skill refinement, that kind of stuff. Jack Plum was a former tight end, uh, which we've had some very good success in the past. Robert Gallery is a great example of that. And then Mason Richmond's a, a true a redshirt freshman, not a true freshman, a redshirt freshman. That's not a lot of experience going up against a guy who's probably going to be a first round pick at defensive end. And uh, wow, we didn't give uh, Spencer much help there when we're putting our our tackles one on one on an island against George. And I mean, and then George, to be fair, was lining up so wide that our guards couldn't help either. He was getting over our tackles so quickly that I saw one play where our I think it was Kyler Shot was trying to help out, but George had already beaten Mason Richmond around the edge. They literally Kyler says, like, well, I can't do crap now. I'm just sitting here with no one to block. Uh I any thoughts on that? I mean, man, this offense line needs to improve. Granted, we're not the only defensive line that's going to be scary, in my opinion, for the next five games is probably Wisconsin. Wisconsin scares the crap out of me from a defensive perspective. Offensively, they actually look so inept. It's, it's honestly kind of funny to watch them play offense right now. But defensively, their defensive line could give us issues. That's the only team I'm worried about right now. Um, but any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so I know that they we were trying to chip the defensive ends at one point. That I did notice. I did see that um, several times throughout the game. But I don't think there was ever we were ever able to get any good chips on the DNs at all. Um, to try to provide, provide a little bit of help. Um, but you know, with that said, um, I mean, I think like the tackles, obviously they're young, they don't have a lot of experience. Um, and you know, really, I, I feel like, like their, their techniques just not, not quite there yet. Um, there's, there's a lot of times, you know, when these guys are pass setting and it feels like they're not getting, they don't get any depth. Um, they just kind of just turn and just try to get their hands out there. And then by the time they do that, the guys are already by them. And I've seen it multiple times throughout the year. It didn't just happen in this game. It's kind of happened all season long um, from, from the tackle position. And, you know, 
I've never played offensive line at at a high level like these guys have. So, but I do I do know how difficult it can be. And you know, when your technique isn't um, you know, really on point, especially as a young guy, um, and those fundamentals aren't there, it's only gonna make their job much, much harder. Um, and I think we've seen that kind of over 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 the past several weeks. And you know, I know that they were trying to do some things with um, you know, chipping the defensive end, trying to get some rollouts going, um, some boot action plays, trying to get those going. Um, to help take those guys out of the play. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, wasn't able to really work to our advantage. And there's times where defensive, defensively, these those guys will start blitzing and then the running backs have to obviously pick that up. So then now that they can't help. And then when you look at the receiver spot, um, you know, we're doing, we're having a tough job, tough um, um, job right now of being able to win one-on-one in man coverage. Um, so it's all, all cumulative effect that's coming from, you know, us being able to not protect on the inside on the offensive line. And, you know, it's a good thing that we have this bye week because as much work as these guys can possibly get um, this week, I think is going to be very, very important, um, especially fundamentally um, because that's got to improve. Like that's got to improve um, without a doubt. And that's where everything I think is going to end up starting because, just improving the technique a little bit is going to help alleviate that problem more um, because I know that the staff is doing different things to try to limit as much pass rush as possible. Um, but obviously right, right now it's just not, frankly, just not working. Absolutely, man. And it's also worth noting that Cody Entz was also out of this game. Uh, backup tight end Luke Lachey, who has played probably between 25 and 40 snaps a game, also out of this game. So when you talk about chipping as well, uh, you're getting a tight end more than likely to sign my men. Right, you know, Schulte, you're getting guys in there who haven't had a lot of snaps uh, to mm-hmm. this point. So definitely something also interesting. We'll hopefully get healthy throughout the break. Um, the offensive line was definitely an issue. A lot of people, uh, anytime the offense struggles, wants to blame Spencer Petras. Um, I will openly admit, not his best game, probably his worst game of the season to this point. But the guy was getting blown up every time he got the ball. And, uh, you know, we know what he is and we know what he isn't. The guy isn't running. He isn't Brad Banks. He's not Drew Tate. He's not Ricky Stanzi. He's not C.J. Beathard. I mean, I'm going down in order of, like, who probably the best mm-hmm. scrambler. He's not Nate Stanley. And Nate Stanley was not a scrambling quarterback. And here we are. We got Spencer. He's at the very low of the totem pole. This guy cannot run. Uh, that's not his fault. Peyton Manning couldn't run worth a darn. But Tom Brady can't run with their crap either. But you also need that protection or need to get the ball out quickly, which means, as you said, the O-line needs to either be able to protect you long enough for the routes to develop or your routes are quick and your wide receivers need to win those routes early and often so you can actually get the ball out there. I thought that was really interesting. Um, there's one play call in particular, and I want to get to play calling here in a second. Um, there's one play call, I think in the third quarter, where I believe Purdue on a blitz and Spencer was getting pressure and he just lofted the ball over to Tyler Goodson. Tyler Goodson gets tackled by his leg. Could have been a first down, wasn't a first down. Iowa fans lost their freaking minds on Twitter about this, saying, why are we calling a running back basically a swing route on third and long in the third quarter? And I, I, my thought initially was this, and I want you to you know, say yay or nay or call me an idiot. I don't really care. He didn't have a chance. There were other probably reads on that play, and the last read was get the ball to Tyler Goodson. And the fact that he had seven guys in his face, like, I just got to get this ball out. I cannot take a sack on third down. Give it to Tyler Goodson. Maybe he can make something happen, but I don't have time to get it to any of my other guys. I do not believe the running back swing route was the primary read. What were your thoughts on Do you remember what play I'm talking about? Yeah, I know the play you're talking about. Um, So that style of play is a very, very common, like, offensive play. Like, when they do bring, like, that zero blitz like that, and you know they just bring right bring everyone um i know there's times like that where you do want to just kind of get the ball out quick to a running back and let them make a play for example when we played michigan in 2016 we called that exact not that exact play um but it was very similar to akram on the goal line um where they ran like that blitz like that and but it wasn't a swing route he basically ran ran a flat like arrow route um but it was basically like the same concept right um you know, they blitz, right? You slip by the blitz, you catch it, and then you go um, and go and make a play. So 
um, it looked like it might have been designed like that because obviously Tyler didn't um, look like he was picking up anyone. He was on a free release, so he was just trying to get out there. I think as fast as he could. Try, I think to try to circle and get outside the defense. Um, and I mean, heck, that kid that made the tackle obviously made a fantastic play. Um, yeah, that's a good play. Because Tyler would have been Tyler would have been running um, for for some time before he probably got tackled. Um, so I'm not as upset at that play call because it's very common for a lot of football teams to do, especially, um, you know, when you don't have, you know, guys on the outside who just go win, win a lot of fade routes, who win a lot on slants, um, one-on-one man-on-man coverage. Uh, so it, it, it is very, it's a common place. So I'm not as upset at that, um, you know, as maybe everybody else might have been. Yeah. All right, I got three more play calls that I want to bring up to see if you're upset about. Uh, first, two quarterback sneaks down in the red zone area. Um, my my my, I thought I started thinking about this a little bit. I was like, man, we we literally called two quarterback sneaks in a row. Purdue clearly knew it was coming. Uh, they had five guys loaded over our center. My only, I have two thoughts here. Uh, I kind of go back and forth. One, no one has stopped this play in three years. It feels like four years. So. If you want a bread and butter play, it's probably that, right? Now, the other piece of me is like, they also clearly, Purdue knows what's happening from an Iowa perspective, and they were ready for that. Maybe you call something up a little bit differently. Maybe you do some, I don't know how you do a fake quarterback, but like you get Spencer under there and then you toss it to Tyler Goodson, give him the ball in space. Um, however, my, my big thought was everyone on Twitter was very pissed off about why are we running a quarterback sneak? My, I'm like, guys, we do this literally every every week, and everyone loves quarterback sneaks when they work. Everyone loves when Spencer Petras rams it down someone's throat. They love when Nate Stanley ran three quarterback sneaks in a row in the Holiday Bowl. Um, I, I guess my biggest thing is beggars can't be choosers, and we can't be upset when we all love the quarterback sneak. However, I do feel like maybe there is a better play call there when Purdue has five guys over top of our center. Thoughts? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... Obviously, I know if, as a running back, um, you know, especially as, as, as if I'm Tyler, um, not that I would put words in his mouth, but if I was in this spot and, you know, at that point in time in the game, it's third and two and we call a quarterback sneak. And then, you know, we have fourth and one and you call another quarterback sneak. I know it's been our best play um, short yardage wise, like by far. Um, but I mean, if I see, you know, five guys between both guards um i'm gonna be I'm, i know i would be upset that you know we didn't try to get me the ball and a little bit i you know off tackle right whether we run a power uh our traditional power plays or we run you know outside zone and, you know to get outside of those guys right because i mean clearly they knew that was coming i mean heck we'd already done it um in the in the ball game uh and had a first down with it so um, I know I would have been upset and I was upset watching it. Cause I mean, third and two, even though, uh, quarterback sneaks been our best play third and two is a long, yeah, long way long. to go for, for a quarterback sneak. And when those guys are bunched up there like that, I just feel like there might've been, there's definitely probably some better options that you could have, we could have explored granted. Um, you know, we've done a poor job, you know, uh, third and short when we call, you know, our traditional, um plays out of it um from basically now until heck when i was a freshman at freshman at iowa i mean it's been it's been an ongoing issue where we haven't had as much success you know with our traditional offense so uh you know i know it's their best short yardage play um but i know that i would have been you know upset um you know about it but you know it is what it is they felt like the coach staff felt like it was the best way for us to um convert that and I mean, I, analytic wise, it's been the best way for us to convert everything. But I think, you know, sometimes you just got to say, hey, the heck with analytics. <laughs> Let's just look at like what they're doing um, and you have to adjust to it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of play calling, too. Right. I mean, it's it's understanding you want to know exactly what the defense is. You want to do the opposite of what the defense is expecting at times. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a time where you want to just do it and just ram it down the throat again. But you have to realize that Purdue was having our number the entire game. They knew what we were doing. Uh, a good example of this is another play I want to bring up. That tunnel screen on the goal line that probably should have been a pick six turned into a missed field goal by Caleb Shudok. Um, 
What are your thoughts on running a tunnel screen that close to the goal line, especially when you have a defender lined up just outside of the tight end, right on the line of scrimmage? I mean, there's a 50-50 chance. Even if that guy doesn't break towards the ball, he's still right in that vicinity. He's a yard or two away. He should be able to get a hand on that. Um, did you like that play call or no? So I know we talked about this earlier in the year. I think when they played Colorado State, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, they ran a tunnel screen. And I'm not a fan. I I know that teams do have success running tunnel screens close to the goal line. But personally, I'm not a fan of it because everything is so condensed. Everybody's so close to close to each other and everything happens so fast that um, you know, even if uh you know, the linemen are able to get out there, right? The the defenders already can see where everything's going and that they're more than likely probably going to beat the blocks that even get out there. So yep. personally, I'm not a fan of uh, having doing running tunnel screens, you know, that close to the goal line. I'd much rather have run a tight end screen or run a running back screen um, just because, you know, first off, you don't have to try. You don't have to get the ball way out there um, when these guys are so close together. I mean, you got to think when you're that close to the goal line, the cornerbacks, I mean, no one's going to be playing the end zone, right? Everyone's going to be in front of the end zone. So they're already going to be closer than what their normal alignment already is. And then, you know, any outside backers are going to be, again, they're going to be hovering right over the tight end or whoever the number three receiver is. And so then they can easily get out to, you know, make the tackle on the place. So if those, so if tone screen isn't executed basically to perfection and you catch the defense you know, on the right right time with the right play call, um, it can be disaster for it. And we almost saw disaster go on that play. So yeah, again. I mean that would that'd have been bad. That yeah. picks oh my gosh, that'd have been terrible. Um the last thing I want to bring up, I'm just gonna quickly touch on this. Uh we're kind of getting towards the end. Keegan Johnson, I would love to see him get the ball more. Uh what he does, the ball in space, what he does the ball after he catches it, his yak ability is phenomenal, his balance, his control when he's getting hit. Uh, he looks like a freaking running back out there with the ball. And he's also so mature, physically mature and strong for being a true freshman. Um, the fact that he's still fourth on the team in snaps uh, concerns me. I mean, this guy has has made big plays every time he's targeted. He has made a big play. I would love to see Keegan Johnson get the ball a bit more. Uh, penalties. Every I don't know what it is, man, but against Purdue, they put us in situations where we get penalties. That Justin Jacobs pass interference, what a poorly timed pass interference. And I also I don't know about you, but that's that was not on Justin had great coverage, and then yeah. he tries to go back to the ball. He wasn't gonna get there. Yeah, that tight end was not gonna get back to that ball. Did you think was there any did I see that wrong? Like that tight end was no, not I mean he was he he wasn't gonna get the ball, he wasn't gonna get there, but um like that tight end lucked out that a quarterback under through the football. Yeah. Um, because he throws that I mean, correctly, Destin could take that. Yeah. I mean, it was perfect coverage. Um, only thing is that he obviously didn't get his head around. If he gets his head around, um, they're not going to call it. But because the tight end tried to fight back to try to get the football, um, you know, ref has to throw the flag every single time. Um, basically, no matter what, because uh, the the receiver's trying to fight back through the ball, and technically, as a defender, you're, you're impeding their ability to do so. So, yeah. So yeah, and then yeah. So the the penalties were really, really, really frustrating because um, they just came at they just came at the wrong times. They just came at every the wrong time. It's like third and long. We just got to get off the field. We just got to get out the field. Oh yeah, incomplete pass. Flag. Ten seconds later cool yeah. guess that's not happening today i mean it, it was just everything that could go wrong went wrong uh purdue i want to quickly touch on a few the purdue uh rotating three quarterbacks what an interesting concept clearly jeff brom had a game plan in place he ran it to perfection i thought um three quarterbacks really was throwing off the defense i mean that one time where i think they had austin burton jack Plummer, and aiden o'connell rotate in three separate plays and on the final one I was trying to figure out where the heck they're lining up at. And they were all yelling at each other to get in different spots. Aiden O'Connell runs in for the touchdown. That was the first touchdown of the game. Um, clearly causing some confusion. We're not going to see three quarterbacks again. Uh, so that's <laughs> – thank God for that. Um, <laughs> unless we knock a guy out. But thank, thank God we're not going to see that again. Uh, obviously, Spencer had a struggle, a bad game, but there's a lot of other issues with that. Um, anything else you want to call out before I get into the final wrap up of the show of basically Iowa controlling their own destiny and not? 
Yeah, just um, I do want to come back to the receivers a bit um, just briefly because, like, we know, like, that Sam Laporta, and we know that Tyler Goodson, and those guys can win pretty consistently in man-on-man coverage. Um, but, you know, those guys, you can easily take those guys out of the game by, first off, you can blitz – blitz linebackers, you can blitz, you know, the running back responsibility, and then you can just bracket the tight end. And then now the re- responsibility now comes to um, additional guys that have to be able to step up and win on man-to-man coverage. Because I touched on this last week. I said, like, hey, Penn State was doing a fantastic job of keeping us man-to-man coverage. When we hit that play to Nico last week, we caught him in a zone, zone yep. coverage. Perfect timing. Right? Perfect timing, right? Um and obviously Purdue watched tape. So they said, I mean, and I know that they're more of a man coverage team, but I mean, yep. um, but they start, they watched tape and they said, Oh, let's just go man coverage. Let's force the additional guys to beat us. Right. Who's not Sam Laporta, who's not Tyler Goodson. Right. And, you know, we're going to force the quarterback and receivers to make plays. So the guy who's done it consistently is Keegan Johnson. Right. So there's no reason for him to obviously not be in the starting lineup and for him to get, you know, additional targets, right? Five plus targets a game because of his ability to win one-on-one in man coverage and to create explosive plays. Um, and I know Charlie Jones does a great job of winning on man man coverage. Um, but I think that they got to take a good look in the receiver room, get an idea of, you know, who can, who can really provide us, um, you know, that huge spark and win on man to man coverage because we obviously don't have a lot of time to throw the football. So we got to be able to have guys out there who can win quickly. And Keegan Johnson has done that. He's shown that so far. Um, so that's a uh, huge credit to him. And I think that the staff needs to look at getting him involved much, much more, I think, as the season goes. So. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more, man. Um I do want to. We have, I mean, the two. We have two weeks until the next game, so there's going to be a lot of talk about this. Iowa doesn't control their own destiny, but when you look at Purdue's schedule, uh, Purdue does not have the easiest slate coming up. They got Michigan State, they got Ohio State, they got Northwestern, they got Nebraska, which is actually a much better Nebraska team than what their record says. But that's pretty much every year under Scott Frost where they're going to lose games in the most ridiculous ways. Purdue mm-hmm. more than likely is not going to win. Every single game from here on out, Iowa just needs to take care of business. I think from an Iowa fan perspective, no one expected Iowa to go 12-0. and Expectations were heightened, clearly, because we go 6-0. We beat Penn State. We beat three ranked teams. But there's just still a lot to play for on the table, even potentially a college football playoff berth. I mean, there's a lot of teams do not look as good as they have in the past couple of years. A lot of opportunity here for the Iowa Hawkeyes. We're going to be covering all that for the future of the show. Um, my wife is uh, upstairs literally getting our dogs like – hyped up she wants to take him for a walk so i'm gonna have to, to, <laughs> to end this Lashawn, any last words from you though before we drop off the show today no no i don't really got too much just you know these guys just got to enjoy the bye week what us as fans now you have to enjoy the bye week and just kind of relax and enjoy football but you know it's still go hawks as always as always, man, it's always go Hawks. And just remind you all that if you want to check out more information across the Big Ten, check out the Locked On Big Ten podcast with Nate Dickinson and the Locked On Big Ten show covering you Monday through Friday, all the news and notes around the Big Ten. And thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. We wish it was under better circumstances. But as we go throughout the week, we'll be talking to you about why Iowa still has a lot to play for and hopefully giving you some hope going forward. I know a lot of people feel like it is the end of the world after an Iowa loss. But, y'all, it is a long season. Not a lot of teams finish undefeated. We're going to talk about all that on the show the rest of the week. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a fantastic Monday, and let's go Hawks.